Okay, our last speaker for this session is someone you probably, most of you know, if you've not taken a class from her, um, it's Dr. Celia Smith. She's been with the U University of Hawaii at Manoa for about 20 years, and she studies primarily marine communities. Um, and this year she was the past president, of, or she's the acting, pre right now, current president of the Hawaii Academy of Sciences. So please welcome Dr. Celia Smith. Aloha. Thank you all for staying. Uh, this will be a shortened talk. Uh, initially, this was planned to be given by if the first half was going to be Dr. Abbott speaking, and I would do the second half. Uh, she's not able to join us today. And with that, I'm sorry to say you'll miss those little stories that go along with these case studies, and you're the poorer as a result of that loss. What I'd like to do today is um, acknowledge that most marine botanists do have an agenda when we talk, as Carla said. We are on a mission as a group to educate the community at large, and this is a great opportunity for me to try and capture two of the themes that I think are the most exciting elements of marine research underway in the sixth floor of the St. John building on the Manoa campus. We have taken a slightly different path to conservation. Izzy and I don't necessarily think of ourselves as conservation biologists, but I think what I'd like to do today is capture some of the exciting finds that she has had in algal taxonomy, th the ability to collect species, bring them in and realize that we have whole new chapters to write in the taxonomy of the greens, browns, and red algae. And then th I'll take the voice uh, back and become the proponent for some of our conservation efforts that are the use of the super sucker for uh, alien algal removal and try to put that in a context so that you can perceive the, the clear and present danger, the threat that these algae pose to our reef communities. So not really strictly conservation biology, but conservation is clearly at its core. In the early days when I was a grad student here at the university, the taxonomy was done in a way that we would have, uh, is there a pointer? No pointer. We would have species come in and as the illustration, the herbarium specimen on the far left, they would be named after an individual like the Sparachnus dodii or the specimen on the right. This is a genus that Max Doty actually established for Izzy. Dr. Abbott and named it Iziella. She then sank it and then brought it. It's now been brought back again. There's a kind of friendly attitude in the way that species were described and a pace that was a little bit slower than the pace we currently have. At this point, with Izzy's activities, we are on a mission to establish living treasures. Uh, this is not just uh, her, uh, illustrated here on the far right with her daughter Annie, but also plants like this, uh, one of five that I'll show you today. This is an alga that was so significant when it was found that on the basis of one dive and four herbarium specimens, Dr. Abbott was able to set this as a new genus of endemic Hawaiian red algae. These opportunities may have been possible for zoologists and terrestrial botanists maybe in the early 1800s, mid 1800s. It's staggering for me to see that we're in the 21st century and still able to actually generate new or orders, families, genera, and species on the basis of our Hawaiian flora. We have over 550 species. Uh, about 25% of them are endemic species. What I'd like to focus on are some of those that are really rare and maybe a single collection, as we see here, for Peleophy Peleophycus. 
This alga underwater was described by the divers as actually looking like flames of lava or fire coming up from the benthic environment where the plant was attached. One collection, these plants uh, immediately established as a new genus. The um, effort that Izzy recognized in establishing this genus was to pay homage to her distant ancestor, Madame Pele, trying to capture that sense of lava and island building. She named this as Pele seaweed or Peleophycus. This has been in place for about 10 years, I believe, and is one of the few that we have, uh, one of actually many that we have never even seen the alternate in the life history. There are two phases in these plants. We've never even seen this phase again. So we have opportunities in our Hawaiian flora to capture elements that are episodic, they may be seasonal, they may be that a diver is in a place at the right time and in the right location. But uh, clearly the name of this alga was recognized, uh, Izzy recognizing an earlier mover and shaker for the Hawaiian Islands. And I think there's actually a, a little link to herself there as well. This alga doesn't even have a genus name yet. It's in another uh, unrelated family, the Nacarioids. Uh, this collection came from Marrow Reef in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. It remains undescribed, although by the basis of the reproduction that you can see from these tetraspores, it's clearly something, it, if you have an algal background, you would be able to see this is clearly something very distinct. Again, single collections, brand new entities as a result of uh, materials that have been brought in from the monument. Uh, this group, uh, there are only two other genera, and Dr. Abbott has actually contributed substantially to both of them. So I think this may be a family of red algae where she's either had a hand or been the principal author for all three of the major genera in this area. The third representative is a beautiful plant in the genus Velaroa, Set Setiana. This alga has been collected by the research vessel, the Oscar Elton Seti, through the lobster trap work that was done. This is, gives you an insight as to how Dr. Abbott actually has a number of people working for her at all times. People are bringing in specimens from a variety of locations. A, a significant amount of this biomass is actually sterile, which means scientists are not able to identify it or to classify it. She finally got one or two specimens that were allow that identification to go forward. Very opportunistically being able to grab those specimens as they come in, realize their value in our diversity and understanding the flora, and move quickly to get them published. So this is a third new entity. A fourth form is a genus Trichocleopsis, which has a new species illustrated here in the herbarium specimen. Now, this is a plant that was actually collected by Jen Smith from Hawaii Island over on the Puako site. Jen was there doing a completely unrelated set of dives that were focusing on herbivory and nutrients as drivers for the algal community and happened to see this plant. Again, we're on a, a limited number of herbarium sheets. I think there may be one or two specimens that are the basis for this description that's underway. Do you get a sense of the of the standing that we have, a significant base of species, but a remarkable opportunity for new species to be identified as a result of collections that are coming in from a number of locations. A final one is the uh, Podina malfitiana, which Izzy, I think, is really proud of. This alga is a meadow former, so it's not rare, but on, without those collections up in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, it would have remained undescribed. Even though it's clearly a Podina, this is a new species, I believe endemic to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, and is a profoundly important alga. This is a meadow former. Juveniles take refuge, juvenile lobsters take refuge under the fans of this alga. There's significant biomass and important ecological ramifications throughout the food chain as a result of the form of this plant only described in the last few years after Bob Moffat, the chief scientist for those lobster cruises, who would religiously bring specimens to the lab for Izzy to work with. 
So although we have probably the premier marine algal taxonomist, you would, and you might think that our flora is well understood, there are clear examples almost every month of a new entity that comes in that is a, yet another chapter in the taxonomy. We are hardly at a plateau in understanding the number and the diversity of these marine plants that are the foundation of our ecosystems. So with that as the the kind of sense of why we need to be better stewards of our coastal environments. We marine botanists need time to get out there and actually sample these communities to capture those uh, rare species and maybe even significant biomass producing species before they're lost. We have simultaneously a threat underway and that is the impact of alien algae on coral reefs and coral and reef communities. So this patch reef is uh, in Kaneohe Bay, native coral dominated. I think you hopefully can all see that. And in three years, we watched that change to this. Do you see the threat that's imposed? Three years overgrowth by uh, an alga that was introduced. This is the Ucuma denticulatum that has the ability to significantly smother the corals that are the foundation for many of these reefs, as well as having significant impact on the rest of the diversity in these areas. We have the scientific data through Jen Smith and Eric Conklin's dissertations to demonstrate the impacts. So the second theme I have for you today is one of the threat that these species pose. Our reefs are changing before they have been fully characterized as uh, the marine botany community would like to be able to do. And ironically, it's an alga that's uh, driving these kinds of threats. Just to give you a, a quick overview of some of our activities, many of you may know that we've been running uh, a number of activities down in Waikiki with volunteer cleanups as well as scientific studies. We have removed through the activities over 100 tons of algae as a part of our volunteer service, and I'm hopeful that we'll have a, another cleanup scheduled in the um, fall semester, right, Cindy? Uh, these have been significant clear costs to the ecosystem when you have this kind of biomass up on the beaches. Uh, it's an economic cost as well as an ecological cost. The change in these communities is clearly seen when we use some sophisticated uh, graphical and similar similarity analyses. We can plot the community of algae that occurred in that era before these aliens were introduced. And so by the, the, those data points captured in the right-hand circle shows the community structure in the era from 1966 to about 1973. This is an era that was well characterized by Do Dr. Doty through his frondose algae of Waikiki studies. We clearly know that those, uh, that reef had over 80 macroalgae and probably a significant number of turfs, the kind that you've heard about today. There was a complex and uh, pioneering characterization of that reef community, giving us a foundation to see where we have, how much we have lost. And so we've gone from having a diverse flora of endemic and native species to a flora that is now with the same practices applied, characterized by having very few species. Hello, there we go. Less than 20 and dominated by two aliens. Uh, Acanthophora and Gracilaria salicornia. So it is this change on the plateau of the community, the change in the nature of the species, which has me really alarmed, galvanizing me to make every effort that I can sustain to build capacity so that we can remove the alien algae from our reefs and allow at least the ecosystem re to recover, as well as the scientists the opportunity to discover what we have before it's uh, lost. So our volunteer cleanups are, for me, a really rewarding activity. We started them in 2002. They run generally on a Saturday morning. Uh, we're under the banner of uh, Ohe Limoe, no more alien algae. We've, this is the site marked by the red arrow where we've taken out 100 tons from Waikiki. We work in a multidisciplinary, multi-partnership level with a number of friends here in the audience, including Tony Montgomery from, T, from uh, DAR, Cindy Hunter from UH, TNC representatives. I see Eric Conklin out there as well. 
So this multi-agency partnership has been a terrific way of helping to uh, inform and educate people as to the threat and the need. But it's also quite clear that there are many places like in Kaneohe Bay where the cleanups just simply aren't feasible. You can't expect 200 volunteers to swim to those patch reefs. They, Waikiki is great because it's so accessible. So we've taken on a second line. Many of you may have already heard about some of this through the newspaper coverage. This is the uh, marine biology boat for, uh, from the natural sciences running the super sucker out to its destination on a patch reef with our goal is to initially, from several years ago, to, I, to test whether we can actually remove algae from reefs where we can't hold volunteer cleanups. The great success of this is that the answer is yes. When we've worked in the, in the Kaneohe area, here's a front end view of the super sucker where a large pump sits and removes uh, water through a pipeline that uh, is directed by divers. Prior to any manipulation of the environment, uh, the scientists get in and score the community because we want to have science as the foundation for this activity. And this has been the basis for part of Eric Conklin's dissertation. Uh, the, al the diver in the upper right is showing you how it, uh, the fronds or the pieces of algae are simply stuffed into this pipe that's essentially an underwater vacuum cleaner. And with this activity, we can generate enough biomass to actually come close to the cleanups that are run with 200 volunteers on a Saturday morning. The difference with the super sucker is that we hope to be able to run it on a Monday through Friday schedule, nine to five, with a crew of four to five, so that there is an efficiency of scale by the use of this mechanized removal. What to do with tons when you generate this kind of biomass? It was quite clear from the beginning that there were several interested uh, participants in, from the community that would come in and want to take this algal biomass. There's nothing toxic about it. In fact, it provides a great mulch and fertilizer. So we've associated ourselves well with the Rapun family who raise taro. They come with their trucks or receive bags of Gracilaria salicornia, take it up into the, the lo'i and actually uh, I'll add that once it's dyed so we t let the Gracilaria salicornia, in this case, sit and, uh, for several weeks and finally die, verified that it's actually dead. There are some questions sometimes. Uh, that goes into the lo'i, and we're actually able to fertilize crops of taro as a result of the algal biomass removal. So in sum, what we have then are two continuum, or ends of one continuum, a uh, research mission driven by Dr. Abbott and her intensi uh, intensity of wanting to capture these elements that are potentially at risk, if not lost, through to the removal of algal biomass as a way of establishing ecosystem health. And I'm hopeful that within a few years we could be able to show the slide in this manner. So we're taking our reefs back and healthy coral return. Thank you. Are there any questions? Papa, na na to ohu e ho ohu i te ala ohi ohu kani ohi ave i wa no ho dua i ohu ohu mu mu i kawa i ne no ho ma na ohu pahi o i kapa li ku kawa hawa. Paliku ika pa ma kani ku ma ku a hakali da ohu leva iya kalawa e haka ano oleke ya ohu no ke no ke hakala la ke ya manu ika ohu ika ohi aha mau me ho aha mau ita le o kale hua pa ne pa ne mai pa ha ike ya mamu e.